I uh, made a zine for you guys, and it will make more sense as I get to the halfway through my talk presentation, but um, I'm just going to run around the room and give everyone a zine. I work at Printed Matter, so um, it's kind of like a dream job for me. I'm very lucky. Uh, we just moved into uh, a new space, uh, three times the size of the last space. Uh, has anyone been to the new space yet? One? Two, okay, shame on you, everyone. Um, it's the space is three times the size of our last space. It has a project uh, room and a gallery space. It is also double the amount of rent uh, that we were last paying. So it's up to people like you guys to come and browse and spend money and support uh, Printer which uh, next year will be our 40th year that we've been running. And it's only with the support of uh, people like you that we will stay open. So, um, <clears throat> so come see the new space. It will knock your socks off. It's very impressive. Um, so uh, my intro was that, yes, I'm from Australia um, and I work at Printer Matter. Uh, my main job there is to curate the New York and LA Art Book Fairs. Um, but I also work with artists on conceptualizing and managing the production of editions that raise money to keep the doors open for printed matter. Um, I don't consider myself an artist. I've dabbled in independent publishing. Uh, as mentioned, I published a journal for a while. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's, my job currently is curator of fairs and editions. Um, but way before I moved to New York uh, to work at the world's largest non-for-profit specializes in, in the dissemination and understanding of appreciation of artist books, um, I was living in Melbourne and very interested in art and alternative cultures and wondered about how I could connect with similar people and create some sort of community. Um, I was around people all the time and I was seeing great things happen, but there wasn't uh, anyone documenting it or... Uh, you know, there wasn't a sense of history or someone collecting it. So um, after spending some time in London and Berlin and New York, I was so inspired at what I saw going on in, in the alternative gay creative uh, side of things that I decided to edit my own journal called They Shoot Homos, Don't They? Uh, for the fourth, this is just a brief intro history. I hope it's not too boring. Uh, so the, for the fourth issue uh, of this journal, they're all here if anyone wants to have a look. Um, A.A. Bronson, the, the director at the time, uh, invited me to the fair um, to exhibit. Uh, had an amazing time. A year later, I moved to New York City and got a job at Printer Matter and the rest is history. Uh, and now it's full circle, dreams do come true. I exhibited at a fair and now I run that fair. So if you dream a little, maybe sometimes these things happen. That was a joke, but anyway. Uh, little did I know at the time when I was making my own art journal that this is exactly a kind of way that artist books came about. Um, and it was a form of communication tool where people could exchange ideas and collaborate. Um, and, you know, uh, so I wasn't, you know, we live in a, we have a very insular world uh, that Andrew and I and a lot of other people in New York work and live in that we just assume everyone knows the same things that we do and the, the history of the city and the history of artist books, but it's not often the case. So in this presentation, I might, I'm not sure if I'm already speaking to the educated and converted of artist books and the books as objects, but I'll just, just bear with me and, you know, have a look at your zine if it gets too boring. But, um, <laughs> So, uh, short time, that was my short timeline to being at Printed Matter. Short timeline for like artists and artist books is that starting in the early 60s, many of the pioneering conceptual artists whose work included performance, environment, sound and site specific work and other experimental media um, began to explore uh, possibilities of the book form as an artistic medium. Mainly people like uh, Kasuth, uh, Mel Buckner, Lawrence Weiner, and, and Nauman. They were kind of like the big guns at the time. Um, large edition and economically produced publications allowed experimentation with artwork that were democratically accessible, affordable, collaborative, and could, and could circulate outside the mainstream gallery system. 
Unlike in art book catalogues and monographs that tend to showcase artworks created in, the me in another medium, the term artist books refers to publications that have been conceived as artworks in their own right. Uh, these projects for the page, uh, that term is thrown around at work all day, every day. It feels like we should have a mantra in neon sign up on the wall. Uh, Max Schumann, my current director, is always all about the projects for the page. Uh, they're generally inexpensive and often produced in large open editions and are democratically available. Uh, the book is a medium that allows an artist's work to be accessible to a multitude of people in different locations at any given time. The more copies produced, the more widely the work can be distributed. It is the potential to reach a large, larger audience <coughs> that lends the book to its social qualities and increases its political possibilities. In this way, the artist's book can be incredibly powerful as a communication force. Um, so that first generation, the Naumans, the Wieners, uh, they kind of dabbled in that, but it wasn't uh, until the second generation of multimedia experimental arts that emerged from the first generation of conceptuals that this idea kind of blossomed and these artists kind of ran with artist books. Uh, so Printer was, um, established uh, by Sol LeWitt and Lucy Lepard in 1976. Uh, it was first uh, a distributor and publisher. Uh, a year later, um, we moved into our first brick and mortar space. Um, Lucy and Sol uh, weren't the only people that started. There were art workers and artists involved as well, but they are considered our founding members and kind of like the mum and pop of the first space that we had. Um, so this talk, the title of it is Books as Objects, kind of threw me a little bit because we have this constant dialogue at work about uh, artist books and what they are and books as objects and even Andrew and I was discussing this before, I kind of might not tackle this, I might go in the other direction as, and talk about books not as objects. Um, which might throw the panel a little bit, but hey, that could be fun. So um, so I thought around that idea and I spoke to Max about it and my co-workers and it didn't sit with me as well as me representing Print and Matter. So um, Books as Objects kind of makes me think of uh, unique objects uh, that are kind of uh, art for the page, but they're un unique works, So, which is not what artist books are. Um, and which kind of reminded me of uh, the Lucy Lepard essay from 68, uh, the, the, dematerialization, the Dematerialization of Art, um, which I'm sure you were aware of, but I just thought I would pull a quote from it to kind of like get loose. I don't know if anyone's met Lucy. She's kind of a pretty feisty woman. She's really amazing. Pretty matter would not exist if it wasn't for a woman like Lucy Lepard. So, um, and sometimes gets lost in the mix. So whenever I talk to people, I will always want to give a heads up to Lucy. So, um, she argued that the developments of conception, conceptualism would transform art criticism. If the object become this is a quote, if the object becomes obsolete, objective distance becomes obsolete. Sometime in the near future, it may be necessary for the writer to be an artist as well as the artist to be a writer. There will still be scholars and historians of art, but the contemporary critic may have to choose between creative originality and explanatory historicism. That idea kind of stuck with me and the idea that I work with at Printer Matter and that these books should be thought of less as fetishized objects and first editions and which buys into the whole collectability and art market and more as conceptual art pieces. So that's my take on books as objects. Um, I mean, my education in artist books uh, was pretty much, you know, making, deciding that I should just become a publisher an editor with no background, but I felt a need to get this information out in the world, which is kind of how kind of the early artist book publishers started. Um, so to come to Print and Matter, it was like this amazing education, um, the wealth of history in the city, especially from the downtown scene of the 70s and 80s, is just there for the taking. There's just like 
there's so much information, especially at Printer Matter. So any time you want to come in and have a chat, uh, Max Schumann has been there for 25 years, has got some amazing stories. Uh, so um, it's a great resource and everyone should use it, but I should stop telling you to come to the store. Being a magazine publisher and editor, I took a keen interest in the back issues of out of print artist magazines produced here in New York City. And one that resonated with me the most was Art Right. Um, Art Right predates 80s zines uh, and DIY kind of culture, like Xerox ephemera, but still has this kind of youthful feel about it. Um, you're holding like a little facsimile reprint in your hand, but I will get to that in a minute. Um, but I should, I guess talking about artist magazines and publishing and how it relates to my whole presentation is that I, I should explain what artist magazines are. I mean, I just gave a little spiel about artist books. So artist magazine publishing is an exercise in ephemerality and transience. Each issue goes out in the world only to be rendered obsolete by the next. To publish a magazine is to enter into a heightened relationship with the present moment. During the 1960s and 1970s, magazines become an important new site of artistic practice, functioning as an alternative exhibition space for de dematerialized practice of conceptual art. Artists created work, works ex expressively for these mass-produced hand edition page pages, using the ephemerality and materiality of the magazine to change the conventions of both artistic medium and the gallery system. Artists now begin to write about the art world from within the movements, carving out a position that circumvented the established critical apparatus, and it was hoped would undermine the art world's power structure. Um, so basically, all all this stuff is all about bringing down the man. I mean, it's to me, it's all reactionary to, you know, wealth and the gallery system and collectors. I mean, it, I mean, it comes back to this idea that art should be for everyone. That's me. That's how I feel about working at Printer Matter. So what exactly is Artist Magazine? Well, the, the magazine becomes an exhibition space, a critical space, a documentary space, and an archival space. With ideas of traditional gallery in serious question of many artists nationally and internationally working outside of these structures, the Artist Magazine offered an important official link in disseminating new work amongst the emerging international community. For artists who work who did not require a physical site for its realization, Artist Magazines function as a simultaneous bridge between artists in very geographic locations and at, as sites through the transnational collaborations could take place. <clears throat> Running parallel to this expanding concept of what a magazine could be, or as a redefinition of what could take place in the space of the page itself. The page subsequently becomes a site dominated by the visual image, absorbing the text within itself, and new fusion permits artists self-publishing to this day. This comes back to my boss constantly saying, art for the page. Because form, function, history of Artist Magazine has been so closely intertwined with artist books, they've always been an important part of print and matter. Um, so, yeah. Art right. You got a little one in your hand. I actually have other copies here if anyone wants to flip through them. Yeah, sure. Yeah, have a look. Um, Somewhere, they're, they're newspaper print, they're stapled. Uh, they're, they're kind of like my favorite things and uh, they're fragile, so yeah, be nice. Andrew's correct there. Uh, so published over five years from 1973 to 78, uh, the three creators, curators, and editors were um, Edit Diak, Walter Robinson, and Joshua Cohen. Uh, they published 19 issues in total. Um, so, the three met in an art criticism class taught by Brian O'Doherty at Bernard College. Uh, Brian at the time was uh, the editor of Art in America and was calling on his um, students to write for the publication, which uh, is kind of a good idea at the time because, uh, I mean, probably they were really cheap because they were students. That was a joke. Uh, but also just, I, I think he felt like these... He, he says that he chose his top students and would um, ask them to uh, write pieces. So 
Um, at the time, they were all in their last year of undergrad and found the whole idea that a publication like Art in America wanted to hear their voice and opinions super comical. They kind of, um, edit was like, threw around this idea that they were baby blood and she was kind of thought it was kind of weird that something like Art in America wanted to hear what they had to say about the art world. Anyways, uh, while writing uh, these pieces, they fantasized about producing a newsprint insert in Art in America. This, however, never eventuated, but the idea stuck. And after enrolling in a Whitney uh, Museum study program, uh, they applied for some funds uh, to produce the first issue of Art Right, which came out in 73. Uh, funny side story, Walter... Uh, at the time had gotten a job as a typesetter and designer for a Jewish weekly newspaper and stole mo most of the typesetting for the first few issues before he got busted and got fired. So kids today can't trust them. Kids of yesterday can't trust them. Uh, that's a joke too. Uh, the thing that strikes you most about these early 20-somethings and their take on the art world was their free outlook on the downtown scene and the decidedly insider point of view. The publication had a different voice at the time. It was sociable, sharp, and in touch. Um, dare I say, they had a radical spirit and innovation that predated the 80s market boom. Often articles were um, uncredited uh, when they were written just to so it would have more of a sense of a voice of the magazine rather than a particular writer. Um, as you're passing around, you'll see that um, most, they would uh, commission artists to do covers for them. Uh, the zine that I've made for you today has an awesome Carl Andre piece as the centerfold. So if you fold it out, there's a Carl Andre piece in the middle that you should put on your desk or on your fridge and just think about art right when you get something out of the fridge. Uh, so, um, so other people that made uh, covers were uh, William Wegman, uh, Richard Tuttle, Vito Conchi and Andrew Shea. There's a really cool uh, jo Joseph Boys cover uh, which was the performance issue um, and there's actually like it relates to a performance piece. Um, other issues were thematic, uh, including performance, video, and painting. And some single uh, artists or collectives would take over the whole issue. Uh, the guy behind the band Suicide, I think he did the last issue. What's the guy from Suicide's name, Andrew? Come on. Blanking. I'm blanking. Anyway. Uh, yes. There you go. You get a gift. <laughs> Um, come see me after the talk. Uh, the issue, uh, so anyway, the issue, the little kind of zine in your hand, which I'm just adding to the ephemera in the world. Two minutes. God damn it. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's the, it's a really important issue that you have in your hand is, uh, issue 14 and dated uh, winter uh, 76, 77. Uh, the cover has a great, Carl Andre did that already. Piece, uh, so let's just, so this, I mean, the thing that speaks to me the most is, uh, there's this section called market research, um, where they ask 45 artists, um, to, uh, uh make statements about artist books. Uh, and it was called market research. There's Kathy Acker, John Baldessari, which, is the first time he used that quote, um, every artist should have a cheap line. And like his gallery here has, has been like throwing that around for since the seventies to try and sell his uh, signed and numbered editions. Um, but because I've only got two minutes left, I seriously thought I'd had a lot more time. Um, this issue of Art Right is just really important because it's, uh, it's winter 76, 77, which is when printed matter started. So it's kind of, it just shows you that at that time there was there was something definitely happening and that's a great Kathy Acker piece but well actually so the the zine that you have in your hand has uh the solar wit and Lucy Lepard quotes which are my two favorites and whenever I talk to students at Printer Matter and talk to them about artist books and how Printer Matter started I always reference these two pieces the solar wit is very dry and very soul, but um, Lisa Lepard finishes with, 
which I will finish with. Uh, I have this vision of feminist art books in schools, libraries, or being passed around under the desks, in hairdressers, in gynecologists' waiting room, in Girl Scout cookies. Uh, my kind of uh, current uh, take on artist books in general uh, is a small paragraph which I printed on the back of the zine, which I'm got, <laughs> I've run out of time to talk, but it's there. It's, it's basically... Uh, in in the introduction, you're talking about swiping and iPads, but um, I just think uh, books aren't dying. Uh, nothing can replicate uh, touching paper and uh, the essence of history. And everyone who's looking at an art right right now is looking at brown newspaper print with staples in it. And uh, that one right there has like potato stamped colors on the front so i mean heart and soul goes into these things and instagram and facebook and ebooks will never replace touching something like that that's me yeah.